welcome to everyone. We have, I think, as of tonight, like 35 or 36 people that signed up. Uh, people will kind of come in and off, but uh, let's get going. And um, so today we will be interviewing uh, Ivan, and I am so happy to, to, to have you on. And as, as you mentioned, we get a two for one because you've also invited your, your partner, Jamie. So thanks for coming. And maybe we'll do a whole separate show just for you, Jamie. I'm sure you have a wonderful story as well. And the goal of this is that- Jamie used to be a dancer in the East End. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, we're definitely having you on the show. <laughs> I used to dance a bit too. It's a comedy routine. You didn't know that it came <laughs> Oh, that's great. Uh, and so the, the, the goal of all this is, is to regroup real estate investors because I don't know for you, but I could talk about this for days and hours and it's just fun to be with like-minded individuals. And so I started this recently twice a, uh, twice a month. So every two weeks and we, right. the goal is to interview someone who's been successful because we can all learn from it. So um, mm -hmm. Ivan, it's, uh, it's all yours. And I'm going to start with my very, very first basic question, okay. which is, how did you get started? How did I get started? Okay, well, I, I, I was um, fortunate enough to, to uh, be born into a family that, that was in real estate. I'll give you a quick, really very quick. Uh, my grandfather came after the Russian Revolution in the early 1900s. He came penniless and um, he, he worked very hard and he became uh, successful in a, in a paper box business. Um, which is, um, and in the end, in one of the buildings where he had a, a, one of his factories, um, uh, the owner asked him if he would like to buy the building because he was, he was going to be selling the building. And it went from there to, to my father. Um, afterwards, years later, we had quite a bit of real estate uh, around uh, the city. Um, growing up, I, I uh, went to my father's office, so I learned a, bit, a lot about management there. He was basically, we had holdings and we were, we were managing them. Um, I did everything from start to finish. Uh, basically in, in, in high school, I was, I was a handyman for the apartments. So I was uh, sanding floors, I was changing toilets, I was changing sinks, whatever had to be done. I was doing it with, with a fellow who was full-time uh, working, working with us. Uh, we, one summer we changed, uh, one summer I spent the whole summer changing screens for, for balcony doors and for windows <laughs> in, 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 in several buildings. Another one, another summer I uh, just changed balconies. So I learned everything. I learned, I learned how to manage properties. In the meantime, there was rent collection. There was uh, rental negotiations every year for increases. So I, I was inside and outside doing both. Um, in, in the 1980s, uh, an ill-timed um, uh, big real estate project, construction project, was undertaken by, by my father, and it led to a, a complete loss. We lost everything, um, which was quite a bit. It was a project uh, in downtown Montreal, and the recession hit. Um, sto um, uh, stores on St. Catherine Street that were supposed to be paying uh, a lot of money per month call it $25,000 a month rent, uh, weren't able to pay $5,000 a month rent by the time it was all done. Similar to what's going on now with COVID, except then it was a recession. It was a real economic recession. It wasn't kind of a pandemic recession. Mm -hmm. Around so, what year was that? Uh, it was 19, about 1990, 1990, 1990 okay. when, when uh, my family, uh, we lost everything. So I had to start all over again. And um, I, I was talking to friends and I was looking for a business to get into and I wanted to do something different. And I, and I was offered uh, an opportunity to buy um, a futon company, a futon manufacturer. You, you guys know what futons are, right? I mean, you must have- Yeah, a, the, the, the sofa bed? Sofa beds, right. Yeah. So what, what I knew about futons and manufacturing was you, you can put it on the head of a, a, head of a, a mosquito. I knew nothing. And my friend said, you're crazy. And I said, yeah, but I want to try it. I want to get into it. Um, but less than two years later, um, the place was closed. I, I lost a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of health on trying to nurse a company that, that I and knew nothing about. That was manufacturing? It was manufacturing, yeah. Uh, okay, so I, it was a production plant and it was a, yeah, a company I, just making um, yeah, sofa I had, beds. Okay. 
at the high season, um, uh, I had 25 employees. It was a 20,000 square foot factory. Um, and it was actually going not too bad. And, and it, was, it was starting to come around. The sales were climbing and I was getting a good, a good client list. But um, at, the, at the same time, there was a very uh, strong furniture manufacturer here in Montreal that went to China and had the wooden frames imported from China. So the frames were landing here in Montreal for the same cost that it was, for the same amount of money that I was paying just to buy the wood to start the manufacturing. Yeah. So it got slammed upside the head and there's a limited market, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I learned my first, I, I guess, major lesson um, is uh, stick to what you know. Yeah. I've been around real estate all, all my life. Um, I was working with my father on and off. I went to uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver uh, to work in BC after I graduated university. And I, and I put myself through an urban land economics program there, which is basically a diploma program, which afforded me the opportunity to become a real estate appraiser here in Montreal. Okay. Um, so after everything was lost uh, in our family, I had to rebuild my life. I had to start from scratch. So um, uh, I had to put food on my own table. And I had my urban land economics diploma from University of British Columbia. And I was talking to someone, I don't remember who, and they said, uh, they said something to the effect of, well, why don't you just try becoming a real estate appraiser? So I opened up the first, the first uh, name on the real, in the real estate appraisal uh, listing in the yellow pages. And I called up the company and I ended up spending 10 years at that company as a real estate appraiser. In the meantime, there was a property in the East End of Montreal that um, was basically an old manufacturing uh, uh, building. It was about 72,000 square feet, if my memory serves me. And I transformed it into uh, 42 artist lofts. Wow. And yeah, it was, it was two thirds empty. I, I, uh, I, with the help of the janitor, we built um, 42 industrial, I call them industrial lofts, um, uh, mainly because of the zoning. The, zo the building had a certain particular zoning, um, which you'll find these types of buildings all over Montreal now. The zoning was basically a combination of industrial and commercial. And artists were allowed to use their lofts for uh, producing artwork. The artwork could take any form of any kind of art, which was pretty interesting because there was a real cast of characters in that building by the time I was, uh, I was finished with it. Um, and I, I uh, developed the property. Uh, it actually made it to CBC, a film. Uh, there was a film about the property on CBC, a uh, documentary on the building. And, um, but the building needed a lot of money uh, to, for maintenance. And I decided that uh, um, I didn't want to inject that kind of money in there, into the building. And another a gentleman, um, I got a call one day out of the blue someone wants to buy your building. It's kind of a cute story. And I said, okay, well, if the, if the, if the offer is right, then for sure. And who, who was making the offer? There was a, 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 an electrician, a, a general, a, an, ele a, an electrical contractor, an Italian fella, about my age, maybe a couple, a couple years older. He had immigrated from, from Italy as a, a young boy. And, and when he came to Canada, the first thing that he did as like a seven years old or eight years old, he repaired toasters around the corner from that building. And he made a promise to himself that one day he was going to own that building. And he's the fellow that bought the building from me. And he's, he's running it till today. It's about, it's got to be... I sold it maybe 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago now. I don't remember. Is he anything. still fixing toasters? No, he's a very successful developer. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very big builder, you know? So, I mean, he went from fixing toasters, he became an electrical contractor, and then he, he went on to be a very, quite a big builder with well, whatever. He did well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, with, that, with the money that I made from, from uh, selling the property, I always was interested in lending. And I was interested in lending for, for a number of reasons. I, I like... I like doing a deal. 
and it afforded me the, the opportunity to do a lot of deals. Um, and I, I'm, because, because uh, our family had lost uh, everything and it was quite a bit, I became very, very um, uh, risk averse. I, like, I just didn't want to take big chances or roll the dice on anything big anymore. And the mortgage business allowed me to spread my risk, spread my money over many different properties. I also realized that I, I did a couple of small renovations also after the, after the uh, futon business, uh, and I enjoyed it immensely. But I, I realized that I, I don't, didn't want to be on, on, a, on, a, on a work site any, uh, anymore. It just wasn't, it wasn't something I wanted to do anymore. Um, so I went into the mortgage business. Um, I called up uh, my best friend uh, since I was six years old when I found my first deal and I, and I said, Mike, uh, I'm going into the mortgage business. Uh, I found a mortgage. The mortgage I think was $300,000 or something. Um, I said, do you want to split it with me? He said, sure. He says, he, obviously he trusts me implicitly, we're best friends. And we did the mortgage together, and that's how I started to do the mortgage business. Um, after that, about about six months later, around what year was that that you actually went full time into the mortgage? I would say um, it's 2020. I would say probably around 2005, somewhere in there. Okay. 2010 yeah. maximum, 2010, but. It's, it's just the years are getting longer now, Axel, so it's like harder for me to <laughs> remember how, when I started. But it's got to be about 20 years or 15 years when I did my first mortgage, actually. You know? okay. So I, I've done a, a, several mortgages after that with my friend, basically. And then I went out, I, got the, I, went, I had the opportunity to look at a, um, an, uh, a property on a mortgage in Old Montreal. And there was another fellow who actually was invited at the exact same time to go see the property to see if they wanted to bid on the on the uh, on the mortgage, and uh, we hit it off. We talked and, and whatever, and we ended up working together for about six or seven years. We built a really nice, thriving uh, mortgage business. Um, but what happened in the end was one of our partners was 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 quote unquote, silent in the management of the, of the, uh, of the mortgage business. Um, he was very good at raising money for us to have funds to, to be able to, to lend out. Um, but he closed down his business, his primary business. And then he found he wanted to come more into the mortgage business. Mm -hmm. And um, this obviously then it became too many, too many cooks in the kitchen. There were three of us there now. And, and the fellow that I had met was very good friends with, the fellow who closed down his business. So we, we decided at that at a certain point, it was about a year after or so, we decided that uh, we were gonna go our own, our own ways. Wait, and, so uh, just to, to, for me to make sure I understand. So at this point, it was a company with the three of you were doing the, the mortgage yes. lending. Yeah. Now, I would, but but did, you, did you just pool your money together? Did you treat the files together? Like how did it work? Basically, basically, what happened was I, I had the most real estate experience, having been in it my whole life. I was a real estate appraiser by by profession, which which was, lent a lot of credibility to the business. Um, the the other partner, yeah. one of the partners, was very very good at at uh, at, uh, at, at um, public relations, um, and he knew a lot of people, uh, lenders. And the third partner was very, very good at raising money. So I was basically the lead in, um, in, in the real estate aspect of it. Um, there was a, the second partner was very good at, at uh, uh, quote unquote, um, schmoozing the, the borrowers, if you want to call it that. And the third was excellent raising money. By, by the, at the time when we, when we um, uh, decided to split up, we had a, a, somewhere around between 105 and 110 mortgages in our in our portfolio, and and we were probably we were somewhere a little, maybe a little over 50, close to 55 million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, in the portfolio. Yeah. So, um, but then you know, it, it's um, we decided to obviously split, which was 
okay. I mean, I, I knew I knew my capabilities, and I knew I knew I had a lot of connections myself. And uh, it's been uh, it's probably been about five years now, I guess. I'm like as the years go, Excel, I lose the track of the years. But I'd say it's probably about four years or five years that I'm doing it by myself already. Okay, that you went on your own, and then just this year, then you partnered up with Jamie. Yeah, it's, that's also an interesting story. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of tell it on, our, on both of our behalfs. Um, Jamie's father-in-law and I go back to high school. And uh, Jamie, I'll, I'll speak on your behalf, Jamie, if you don't mind, unless you want to... Absolutely, you wanna... please. Okay, so basically uh, Jamie was living in New York and he returned back to Montreal uh, with his wife to, to build their family here in Montreal. And um, he was, he, he's interested in the lending business. It's, it's an interesting business. So have his, his, his father-in-law uh, called me up one day and said, listen, I think you should sit down with my son-in-law because uh, I think it would be a, a really good, um, uh, there would be synergy there. You know, they would, you could really, really uh, benefit by being together. And it uh, took about a year of dancing, I'd say, or maybe a little bit more than that, somewhere in there, of just getting to know each other slowly and, and whatever. And uh, it's been an incredibly, an incredibly uh, amazing experience. So just, just as, a, as an aside, you know, you say, what, what do you learn, what do you learn uh, in life and in business and everything, is that you just really never know what tomorrow can bring. Yeah. You know, so like it's, if you think a deal is going to die, it just happened to Jamie and, and myself this week. I, I, I put out a letter of, of offer on a loan in September. And I, and I basically, you know, I would think about it every couple of weeks, whatever happened to it, this and that. And, f and at, the, at the middle of last week, the guy finally called me up. I think we're ready to go ahead and do, do a deal. So something that I thought was completely never going to happen happen you know so like uh it, it's it's you just you just never know so um yeah and that's really been it it's uh it's it's been a great ride it's not over yet mm -hmm. um yeah i got a, a few kilometers left in my gas tank i hope <laughs> you know? for sure I, and, if I, that, I, and if not then i'll have to go electric after that that's all yeah. <laughs> that might be a good idea regardless that's um, that's right exactly. I, I'd, I'd love to go into a little bit more in, de in detail about the uh the, the the private would, would it be okay if i call it the private lending mortgage private sure. lending sure, um, sure. in my not so long ago ignorant mind i used to think that a private lender was like just a guy who's got like tons of money and he doesn't know what to do with it and he just lends it to people and it right. took me a, a little bit of time to realize that just like any other business they go and they raise money and then mm -hmm. they lend it to somebody else and they make a spread and right. you know we have 20 people on right now most of them young-ish investors. And mm -hmm. I'd love to hear for you as a lender, like what, what's two or three pieces of advice you would give to a young investor who's looking to raise half a million to go close that triplex? Mm -hmm. Well, when, when you're, it's a good question. It's a very good question. There's, there's, the, there's some lenders out there, private lenders, that do have their own money, okay? And they're very, very wealthy people. And the only person that they have to answer to in the morning is the guy in the mirror or the woman in the mirror, you know, nobody else. So th th when they're in that kind of position, they can say, you know what? I like the person sitting across from me and I'm going to lend him and I'm going to do business with him and then and if I lose half a million dollars, then it won't change my life. So there are people like that out there. Mm -hmm. um, if someone was going, if if someone was going to ask me, I can only speak for myself, and they want to raise some money and 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 um, and and uh, buy something, the first thing that I look for is does the guy know or the gal know what they're doing? You know, like, it's not just like they showed up yesterday and they see a property and they just want to go and they, they want to go and buy it and they want to use somebody else's money to do it. Um, it can be done. 
There's no doubt about it. Um, but it just, it wouldn't happen in, 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 a, in my case, you know? So um, when I want to do a mortgage, I look for the person sitting across the property, uh, the table from me. I look at the property and I also look at, um, uh, is there, what's the likelihood that I'm going to take back this property or have to take back this property? And because my goal with my investors is to earn a better return on the money. It's not to take a property. No. Uh, when it has happened, it's happened rarely. I'd say five times in the five years. Five times out of how many loans? Five, five, out of about 500 loans. But I've done about 500 loans. I'd say five loans. Um, and I, I would think... When it came to court, if you want to call it that, maybe five times in the, in the whole time. And I would say there was two properties that we actually took back, that we actually had to take possession of and then had to sell it or do some own re our own renovations or whatever it is we had to do. So I'm pretty proud of the, of the track record, that's yeah. for sure. But um, if someone was going to approach me, I would want them to have a really good game plan I would want them to know, I would want to know that they really uh, had a good look at the, at the property, which is very difficult to do in today's market because there's just like you saw today, there's just so much money chasing real estate in Montreal right now that you just have to be ready to, to close on a property very quickly on the type, types of deals generally that, that I do. So most of the loans that Jamie and I do are, are I would say probably started around $500,000. There's some that are less than that. Um, we did a loan of uh, in, at the beginning of March, I believe it is roughly uh, for eight and a half million dollars. Wow. Uh, we looked at, we're, we were considering a loan of $5 million now and we have a couple at, at $2 million as well. So we there and the loans that are eight and a half million dollars, right? I mean, we can spend weeks investigating the property, doing our due diligence. And the, you, generally the buyers and the market for that type of property is generally, I say not all the time, is not as hot as let's say a 10 or a 12 unit in Park X, for example. Like in part, there's like a thousand small developers chasing any listing that pops up, which is why I recommend for anybody who might be there out of the 20 participants um, to go knock on doors, hire a couple of high school students for the summer, get them on the phone, just hand them a phone book uh, for, for 10 streets, 20 streets, and just have them start calling. And, you, and maybe you'll run into a property where there's a, an elderly couple that are just moving out and you have to catch them at the, at the right moment and they want to sell and that property never gets to the market. You know, there's, there's a very successful guy who started, he's, um, I've done two, I did two loans with him. He's done many, many loans. Um, he um, started as the fella that would clean the apartments after the, after the owner was, was finished renting them as an Airbnb. So the fellow would go in there and literally clean up the apartment after it was, had to be, had to be re, re, uh, re, re, uh, restaged for the next Airbnb customer. He probably has six or 700 units now. Wow. Like, He's like, and that's all in less than five years. So, and he did it all. My point is he did it all by not waiting for listings to come out. If you wait for a listing to come out, you're, you're sitting there and you're like, you're, you're, you're just a, number, a, a, a line. You, and it's your, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bid up the price. You, you might end up overpaying for the property. And, and um, it's hard to tell in, in today's world with the interest rates being low and they're talking about them staying low till 2022. But at some point, the music is going to stop. It's, it's if, if, I don't know what's going to make it happen because the governments are just throwing so much cash at people these days. 
and there's very few assets that 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 people feel comfortable in other than real estate you know despite what the stock market is doing but i do know and i feel in my heart in my head that the music is going to stop and some guys are going to get stuck big time just not being able to make payments and it's going to be a lot of either dumb private mortgage lenders or dumb bankers that are going to get stuck holding a bag and it'll be the people with a lot of loose cash that are going to be, make a lot of money like one of the most successful guys that i know um he's, he was a real real entrepreneur and he started in real estate in, in 19 um 1970 or 68 or six, somewhere around there. And he, he had a bicycle repair store on, on Sherbrooke near Guy. And the owner of the building uh, called him up at the end of his lease and told him, I'm now tripling your rent. So here is a bicycle repair shop. He was selling high end fancy bikes imported and he was assembling them and this and that, and this is what he wanted Never to do. Knew. Still, you can't triple your rent. Right, right. So he said, he said to himself, this is incredible. I'm, I'm playing around with bicycles here and I see what this guy just did to me. I'm in the wrong business, right? <laughs> so so he, he took his first swing at, at a small little property, a, a duplex or a house or whatever. And I was friendly with him for a number of years. And he said, Ivan, I lost $25,000 or 50 or whatever the number was on my first deal but I wasn't going to give up. Mm -hmm. the, the guy is, you have no idea how wealthy this person is. It's many years later. He does, he does um, uh, projects in the, in the multiple millions of dollars. Uh, he owns a private island. He's a, and the thing that got him from A to B was very smart, obviously. He understood what he, 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 he really, took a basic understanding of what he had to do to make money in real estate. He had a good eye for value where he could increase value. But I'd say the most important thing, in whatever you do, is never BS. Because no, no. you always have to assume, and he even said it to me, we were talking a couple of times. He says, Ivan, we do, you just don't BS anybody. Because you always got to assume that the other guy sitting across from you will know you are. And eventually it'll come out. You look like a fool. Exactly. So, yeah. so I'm I, like, so when he's, when, it's better to go into a guy and say, listen, I want to borrow 100% of the money. I ain't got a penny in my pocket. I want to borrow 100% of the money, but this is going to be my plan. And if you run into the night, uh, the right partner, the right investor, you're going to have a pal for life and you're going to have mm -hmm. money for life. But if, but if you go in and you, and you try and assume that, okay, this detail will not work out or that detail will not work, and I won't tell them that part. Uh -huh. that, that's, that's, that to me, personally, is a recipe for, for disaster. So I, I've talked a lot, I apologize, um, but you asked a, a, a really important question, I think, is how do you, how do you go into a private lender and... and, uh, and um, Managed to get money from from him, so that's that's yeah, yeah that's really it. So well, because because you mentioned the the, the by the way, sorry, just one, just one yeah, other yeah. thing. Sorry, Axel, the fellow that I just told you about, he got started with a private lender. Okay, so okay. like, and now he he became a very big private lender and a big developer, mm -hmm. properties around the world, and he's like, but he he found a good private lender. Who, who basically had a lot of trust and faith in him. He, he was straight with him every single step of the way. If a project is not going well, make the, make the private lender a party mm -hmm. of it right away. And, and he built it from there. He built it from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd be, I mean, th there's so much that you've, th th that you've shared already. And um, I, I just like to understand like, so some of the deals that you're working on now if, if you can think of like, let's say your last three to five deals um, in, in Montreal, wh what kind of property is it for? Is it, is it optimization? Is it buy and hold? What's your typical, typical project? 
Okay, right. Well, our our lending lending that we do is short term lending, right? So it's not it's not long term amortizations or five year terms or any of that. It's it's one year term. Um, generally, the 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 loan is closed for for six months and it can be repaid without a penalty after the end of the sixth month, at the beginning of the seventh month. So the people that we cater to are, are a lot of people that are buying duplexes, triplexes, uh, maybe a fourplex or a five, and they're, they're um, um, enticing the tenants to move, whether it's through, through a, a, um, money or, or, or other apartments that they, they might own already. Uh, they're renovating them and they're turning these properties into un either undivided condominiums or they're just um, uh, renovating in the, and then, you know, getting 50, 60 percent, 70 percent rent in increases on the property. Mm -hmm. So we, we have, a, I do, a, uh, Jamie and I do a lot of business like that. Um, we, we, we have um, one that we're considering now where it's a, a family that's uh, dividing up uh, assets. Uh, the father passed away and they want to divide up assets. Now we did uh, one, pro one uh, we've done, a, the one we did for, uh, in March was for, uh, was, uh, was basically a business loan that was secured by real estate. The people wanted to buy a certain uh, property. Um, they didn't have the cash available at that moment. We had faith in their business. We had faith in them. We had faith in the real estate that they were buying. So we did that loan. So. My, my point is, is that um, I know I'm talking to with, with real estate people. I'm not really talking to lenders, but the, the, I personally, and I know Jamie personally, are very open to duplexes, triplexes. Uh, I've, I've done 20 loans with a fellow who, who's a very successful builder who, who has a close to a $50 million net worth value. It's after mortgages, fifty million dollars. Can probably buy me, buy and sell me many times over personally. But he hates to deal with banks. So, for example, he'll go and he'll find a property. Another good good thing that he does is he'll find, he'll go scouring the city, mostly the west side, for uh, small apartment buildings with twenty units on them. Let's say but he knows that there's a very big lot on where that building is sitting on. So he knows that he can go, he can buy it, and he knows that he can add another 10 units to those 20 units. So he'll come to me. I've done a lot of loans like that with him. So there's people like that. It's, it's, a, mat, it's a matter of having an eye to where you can add value. And also, um, I got a little bit off track, so I hope, I hope you don't mind. But, um, I don't know. So those are the deals like... Um, I have a very, another very, we have another very good uh, uh, borrower that's, that's fantastic at finding those off market properties and he'll renovate them and, um, and he'll, he'll re-rent them or he'll sell them. Sometimes he, he likes to sell, sometimes he likes to keep and generate, generate uh, uh, revenue. One good thing is, is also in, in, in our case is is that um, if, if someone doesn't, if so, let's say for example, you wanna buy a property for half a million dollars and you don't have the half a million dollars, but you do have another property, then it's possible to structure a loan where the half a million dollars will be loaned so that you can buy the property, but a second property will be taken as collateral in order to reduce the risk for the lender. And, in those cases, it can also be that uh, more than 100% of the property, uh, the property purchase can be uh, made party of the loan because if it's $500,000, then maybe there's another three or four units that you want to fix up for $15,000 each. Maybe you're going to be tight for cash flow so we can add the interest payments on top of the, of the capital amount of the loan. The idea is, is to build a long-term relationship and whether it's with me or any other private lender and, 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 um, and explain the game plan. If the game plan makes sense, it'll go, it'll go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, um, 
actually, I'd like to open the floor for anyone to, to ask questions. I saw there was just one, a very good one actually from uh, Kevin. Uh, if you don't, just want to go and ask uh, Ivan and Jamie directly. We can do that. Hey, uh, hey Jamie, hey, uh, Ivan, I don't know if you guys can hear me properly, but yeah, here absolutely. it goes. Um, sure. uh, as private lenders, I was wondering if you were mostly raising from uh, private individuals or if you also had ties to financial institutions such as banks or maybe, you know, uh, non-chartered uh, institutions. Well, right, for right, right now, we're, we're raising fun, fun, uh, funds from private individuals. Um, Jamie's spearheading a, um, a transition for us um, where we're going to start using uh, uh, financial institutions as well because we're, we, the, the business is at a point where we can greatly expand it uh, with, the, with the backing of the financial institutions uh, behind us. It also allows us to lower our uh, interest rates because um, you know we live in a, we, the, the, the private lending business um, has become very popular in the last four or five years. And it's like anything else, it's a supply and demand business. And because there's so much money uh, uh, sloshing around the economy right now, people are looking for any kind of any kind of, um, of uh, um, return return on their money over and above the the two percent the banks are giving. So, uh, so that's really how it how it goes. But for now, um, Jamie and I have a combined uh, thirty or thirty five people that that lend with us on a, on a on a regular basis. Just out of, cur out of curiosity, what's the minimum investment? For, for into any one loan by a, yeah. by a private? No, like if I wanted to invest with you, what is the minimum minimum capital you'll, you'll accept? I don't think it makes much sense under $50,000. Oh, okay, as a, yeah. As, yeah. A, as a private lender, you know, but um, just because of the, it's a lot of work mm -hmm. and, um, and I will not take money uh, from someone that, that if it's not money, they can easily lose and it won't change their life. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, I won't take a, an old, you know, I won't take somebody's $5,000 and make some money with, you know, it's just, no. it's, 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 it's a, we, it, the lending business can be very good, but there's risks, mm -hmm. let's face it, you know, so, and, and uh, people have to understand that there's risks. I, it's funny, I had a very good friend of mine who became a lender uh, with me and after two years of lending with me, uh, she said, Ivan, I thought these things are always guaranteed. I said, what? <laughs> First of all, I never said that, number one. And they're not always guaranteed. We're going into risky, riskier investments, you know? So like people think it's just, uh, it, there's, there's so many private lenders around that don't understand the real estate business, you know? Uh -huh. So, and people don't, people, a lot of people think it's, it's an actual, like a guaranteed investment certificate and, and it's not, you know, so, um, so that's, and again, a long answer for a short question. <laughs> I'm curious, what is the return that you promised your investors if that's not too confident? No, no, it's fine. All our, all our uh, loans, whatever is written on the deed, that's what the investors get. There's a lot of lenders out there that, take a, a point or two from their investors, but that's not the way uh, uh, Jamie and I work. Sometimes we'll have a process that will we'll give different investors different uh, uh, interest rates on, on our loans, but that's only a reflection of the level of investment that they're putting in. Uh, so like, for example, um, uh, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit long and complicated uh, uh, an explanation, but, but the basically, if someone needs to have, uh, wants to put in a lot more money into one particular loan, um, then they would ask for uh, um, more security. And Jamie and I provide that security in exchange for a lower interest rate to them only, but they will put in a great deal more. But, and that also allows us the opportunity on larger loans to offer lower rates to, to the people who are borrowing from us. It's a, uh, it's, it's it's a it's always a numbers game and and the pie you just decide how you want to slice up the pie. Yeah. But in the end, everyone everyone has to everyone has to, lenders in the past 
when I first started, and, and even up until four or five years ago, were used to dictating the, the, the rates. And uh, the rates were sometimes really crazy numbers, you know, um, um, like 16, 17, 18 percent. But now, because, like I said, it's a supply and demand business, you just can't, you just can't uh, get those kinds of rates. And if you're getting those kinds of rates, it's because really the property is in trouble or the borrower is really in trouble, and you'll probably end up with the property at the end. You know, so uh, that's not the market that. that that, we, that uh, Jamie and I want to be in. We're, we're, we're business people and we want to get a good retu- return on invested money. And we want to develop long-term relationships with, with guys that, uh, that, that want to grow. Successful. I want, yeah, that want to grow a business. You know, like years ago, uh, I remember uh, when I would go into a, a bank or whatever, and I, I, I'd be with, uh, with a family member or whatever, the, the banker the banker stayed in that bank for like 25 years and you established a relationship with that banker and, and they got to know you and they got to know your business and you got to know them. And if you needed, you needed a few bucks, the guy could sign off on it. But now the way banking goes is that the decisions are all made based on a, on a, on a, on a, a formula based on a, a certain a, a set of criteria and uh, the, the boxes have to get checked off in Toronto, <laughs> you know, Pretty not much. even Montreal, right? So, uh-huh. so what are what are, what are good private lenders doing today? They're doing what banks used to do, twenty five or thirty years ago. They're sitting down with a lot of people. It's a numbers game. You'll find maybe three, four, five, six really, really good guys, and that's going to be your core business. You'll probably take an extra chance on them at the start, but without any risk there's no reward uh-huh. right so some of the people that 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 borrow borrow regularly really started off with not a whole bunch but it seemed to be a relationship that was that seemed to be worth building and through the years the people have made a great deal of money probably more money than the lenders have but that's that's fantastic that means everybody's doing well yeah you know, hey, so it is. Johnny, you had a question? Well, you got to go off. You got to go off mute. It usually helps. Mm-hmm. It's okay. You'll, you'll... Maybe before you, one, of you, one of you fellows ask a question, just say who you are and, and what it is your, your goals are. Hi, Ivan. Thanks, uh, Axel. I finally got my uh, my mute to unmute, so that's that's nice. You had to put on your shirt, right? We know. That's it. That's it. You know. <laughs> look good. I got a haircut yesterday, just for you, Ivan. There you hey, go. Me too. Good job. Good job, guys. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, my name's John. I uh, I've been on and off in in the buying properties or or selling them or flipping them for the last uh, I would say ten years. I took about a four year stop on that to, to start and raise a family. And even before that it was a little, little bit complicated in life. So really almost five, five to six years, really, I had to just step back. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we started really small, just my wife and I with a, a triplex that we bought, uh, renovated it, rented it out, lived in it for the minimum down payment that we had to put. Uh, and, and luck had it that, you know, the equity grew substantially within two years and we Great. decided to break a mortgage and refinance and purchase a duplex, uh, created a triplex out of it in the basement. Mm-hmm. Uh, luck would have it within that year or half a year of renovations, property values went incredibly high during that time too. Great. So we refinanced that, got all of our money out. Uh, and that was always the plan before, you know, even knowing anything about real estate, I didn't really, uh, we didn't know very much about real estate aside from, doing exactly that buying what you can doing what you can with it making sure that you can make money out of it um and and so we've refinanced those properties two or three times i ended up selling that very first one uh to invest in a quick flip project a nine-month project uh that went for pretty well uh, there's some complications in a flip i don't think i'll do that again um, but uh so now we're uh you know we're ready for the next project so that's basically where we're at mm-hmm. 
Uh, Ivan, I want to ask you about uh, yourself and Jamie, really, in terms of a partnership, and maybe this can be taken offline. I don't know if you're comfortable sharing this information uh, up front like this, but uh, what would be the, the largest lend that you and Jamie have done, and, and what was the rate, I'll give you, make it simple, range of the interest rate that that would have been? if you don't mind asking that question, or if there was a project presented to you um, that was really an interesting project or could be made into an interesting project with, with experience uh, behind it, would that be something that would be interesting to you as well? Now, I'm not asking for myself, but I am. Sure. No, the, the, it's, 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 um, I, I, right now, right now I'm in, in involved in, um, Three, three or four projects with guys that started out strictly as borrowers with me, and we established a good relationship. And and you know me bugging them a lot enough, <laughs> they finally let me become their partner. <laughs> you know? So uh, even though I was investing with them anyways, but um, uh, so all that to say is if if a deal is is looks good. And, and I'm invited in, or, or my lending group is invited in, or a limited number of guys are invited in to become partners in it, and it makes sense, and there's always something to do, for sure. Um, a lot of the people that we deal with uh, rather would rather just uh, keep, uh, keep uh, Jamie and us as, as lenders, and that way there's one less set of people that they have to discuss, uh, um, discuss plans with, you know. So um, I, all that to say is I'm happy, we're happy to do both. Um, the standard rates for, for us, uh, for a first rank mortgage is, is 10% plus a 2% fee. And if it's, um, if it's a more complicated or if, it's, if it has to be a second mortgage, then it would be 12% plus two. And depending on the size of the loan, um, you know, we, we, we talk, we look, we look at each individual deal. Um, we had one deal that came up and Jamie and I are working on it uh, right now where it's impossible for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, for our, our, our invest our borrowers to put a second rank mortgage on it. So we're looking at actually becoming uh, quote unquote quasi, uh, quasi partners, like lenders, but, but equity partners without the responsibility and that, of course, is a higher interest rate because we was a lot more uh, more involved in it. Um, but um, we accomplished the goal of being a, a lender uh, without being a lender. You know, so um, I sort of, if I, I don't pat myself on the back very often, uh, Johnny. But uh, if if one thing I will pat myself on the back for is I I can usually and Jamie's actually really good at it too is uh, finding creative solutions you know like i never look at a problem as being a problem i look at it, I look at it as being a, a potential solution just waiting to be found and and uh, that that's really what it is so if you for example found a property and it might be just a little bit too much for for you to to uh to um to take on right now then for sure we'd look at it for sure uh, we'd be open to it it's it's our business uh, real estate you know and, and uh I know Jamie loves doing it. That's for sure, and um, and I do too. So uh, yeah, definitely. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Because because I, I I had technically a whole list, but I kind of <laughs> like how it goes, and it is what it is. I want to be mindful of your time and respect the. I had said kind of one hour. I don't know if you're okay to go a little bit overboard, but I don't want to keep you all night because that wouldn't I be fair. Know. It's okay, Axel. I don't even know what time it is. I can't even see. It's it's, it's almost it's almost nine. It's almost no, it's, an hour. It just okay. eight started. Eight yeah. <laughs> uh, now uh, I do have a, f a, f a set of questions that I like to ask um, every, sure. every every guest. And so, okay. kind of like first thing that comes to your mind, um, what's your your favorite real estate book or the one that had the biggest impact on you? Book. I haven't read a real estate book in many, many years. So, That's but, fair. Um, but um, all, all, the, all the books that I did in my urban land economics, I mean, there was financing in there. 
It was understanding how cities spread, uh, what, cr what creates cities, the economies that drive the growth of a city. Um, I, I, I enjoy listening to some economists these days, like, um, uh, and how, how they see how cities are developing and how neighborhoods develop. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say there was, there was an actual book um, that, that's pointed me in a direction or taught me something really eye-opening. Okay. Uh, but the, but I, I, I like to watch uh, successful people and I like to learn from successful people. And, uh, you know, there's been some really influential guys that have been really, really uh, successful and I try and emulate a little bit what they do. You know, but that, but no books come to mind, unfortunately. Okay, that's fair. Um, mm -hmm. Is is there? Oh, and before I ask this, I want to give the context. Is that we met with uh, Ivan last week to discuss to discuss a deal, and we went over the numbers. And at the end, he kind of looked at me and said, "No, Excel. Sometimes the best deals are the ones we don't make." And in my head, it was like the, it was like you know the, this perfect moment where we actually we had a business meeting in a park. Uh, with a fold-up table and two chairs and stuff and he said that and it was just like the, the, the chemistry the atmosphere and stuff it was like i recorded it and I, i'm pretty sure i'll remember this moment for maybe forever for a very long time and so what i wanted to ask you is is there a, a significant business quote that you go by other than this one yes and it's 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 um i have i have it on my wall and it's it's, it's uh, not necessarily strictly business but it says it's a, it goes something to the effect of as soon as you commit, the universe will conspire to assist. I like it. So I just want to say it one more time. As soon as you commit, the universe will conspire to assist. And, the, and it, it came to me a, f a few years ago after I started in business or whatever. And it, it was just like um, I was cruising along in business. And then I realized that if I really want to get much bigger and I really want things to really roll, then it, it, it'll, it, it, you have to commit. And just somehow by committing, people get attracted to you and people want to do business with you and it opens up a lot of opportunities. So that's the one that's, that's the one. I, and I think it can work for anything in, in, in life. It doesn't only have to be for business, you know? If, if, you know, marriage, uh, marriage, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Sorry, maybe that was too philosophical there. That's okay. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another one is what was your boldest move as a real estate investor? In this case, as a, as a businessman and lender, boldest move. The, the boldest move was the dumbest move. Because I knew I was, because I knew that I was going into a loan that wasn't going to be great. But I said to myself, if I don't go into this loan, then a lot of things won't happen for me. So I sort of, yeah, it's, it's a long story. It's hard to, it's, at some point, maybe it'll have to happen or maybe it won't. You're going to have to swallow very hard and you're going to say, this is a, this is a, this is a, it's a fork in the road and, and I'm either some of the b best guys that I know and really, really successful, successful guy. He's not even 30 years old yet. I don't think um, every time I go to the notary with him, his hands are shaking, his hands are shaking, but he, every property that he touches, he doubles values. Right? He goes in, he's nervous like crazy. He's like, he's got this lump in his throat and this and that, but he goes in as nervous as he is. And then he just does his work and he does what he has to do. And he does what he does well. And then he doubles values and like, he's really amazing at it. So, so what's the boldest move? Sometimes the boldest move is the one that makes you the most nervous, but it has to be a calculated, a calculated bold move, you know? So, I, I um, when I sold the property, it was it was kind of a bold move that one that I sold the the, the industrial loft building because it was it was churning out a lot of money. It was it was very very good, and it 
probably would have kept on churning out money, but it wasn't something I really wanted to do. I didn't want to just own a property and collect rent. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something different with my life. I felt that I could go on to something different and uh, I needed to have the cash from the sale of that building to do it, no matter what it was going to be, you know? So, so I think selling the building was a pretty, a pretty big one also, because it would have been just steady cash flow and it would have been paid off a long time ago and it would have been a ton of equity and, 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 uh, but, it, but I, I was too bored. I didn't want to just sit there and do that, you know? But on the other hand, it's really funny you talk about what's good and bad. An opportunity came right afterwards for me to buy a, um, a strip center. And it was a really, really well-located strip center, but I didn't know anything about commercial real estate. And I ended up becoming a very, very small partner in it because I didn't want to take the risk. The whole property, I think, was three and a half million dollars going back, going back to 19, going back to 1990, you know, back to 2000 maybe. Mm -hmm. It's 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 over 13 million dollars that property now. Wow. So if I would have had the, the boldness to take all the money that I had from the sale of the building and put it into buying that property, it would have been a it would have been a score, a very big score. So. But do you, you know what? Everything you do is you do it for a reason. And yeah, you can't, and, and you can't live with the regret of not buying that. Definitely not. Definitely yeah. not. So, so basically, you got to take everything as as a learning lesson. Mm -hmm. So, and and you really, really got to know who you are. You know? Well, real estate is a good test of all that. I mean, you have to push yourself in ways that you didn't even know you were capable of sometimes, and. It's running a full business. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, last question, and I don't know if you're comfortable with it, but I'm still going to ask you is where can people find out more about you? And you don't have to share anything. If not, that's fine. Um, it's just... Well, if, they know, if they know you excel and you want to pass on my, uh, my information, that's fine. Perfect. Perfect. That's fair. Definitely. That's fair. It's good enough for me. Yeah. And Jamie too. Absolutely. And uh, we'll connect. Uh, I'll send you a little email after and we'll have a good conversation. Because then Jamie's story is better than mine anyway. So. Well, we're going to have to have him on. The goal of all this, again, is to inspire people because all of us are as being involved in real estate and looking for deals and so on. We're all kind of at our desk and in our closet and driving around looking for places, but we need to, we, we need to have a, place to gather and chat and share ideas and share stories and yeah there's the club investisseur immobilier and there's plenty of other places but this is just a, a low-key cheap fun place to come and hang out twice a month so yeah it's like anything else though right excel it's you're going to get 199 no's and the, the, the hundredth one will be the yes it's a numbers mm -hmm. game you got to yeah. knock on a lot of doors to find the deals and it's it's a numbers game you know, like I, when, when I first started doing mortgages, I would, I would, I would take literally a hundred calls and do one, one mortgage out of the hundred calls. And now, now I'd, I'll, I'll get five calls and I'll do three loans because with time, people understand my business just in the community and the lending and the brokers and the whatever. And they know, they know uh, what kind of loan I'll want to do. But when I first started out, I was like, I had to be all over the map. I had to talk to anybody and everybody. And I had to look at a lot of bad loans just because I was hungry and getting started. So my point is, you got to knock on a lot of doors to find the one person that wants to sell their property. And you just never know where it's going to come from. And, and just, would, it, would you also say, is it because now you've gone more specialized? Or, or people, they, they only, they, they know exactly what kind of loan you're going to do. And otherwise they won't bother you calling you. Because when you say it used to be a hundred to one and now it's three to five, I really want to dig and understand what changed. Uh, well, the, my network of people that, that are calling me uh, to, to do loans and, and brokers, notaries, accountants, whoever, they just, they just know that, just don't call me with, with, maybe smaller loans or 
I had to, also when I first started out, I was doing some residential mortgages, and I don't do residential mortgages. You know, just just uh, it's it's a credit problem type of business, and I don't and I don't do that anymore. And, so, and you're, you're getting your money back within two years. Well, it's it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult thing. You get into people's personal lives, and it's it's not the same thing. But but uh, but yeah. So now it's. You know, I have a good, I think it was a good solid uh, network of people that bring loans to me. And like uh, guys like UXL and, and the other people that are participating, if we hit it off, then it becomes, it becomes a good solid, a good solid uh, base to build, to build a business. Like I said, bankers 25 years ago, you'd see the same ma manager in the branch for, for, for five years, 10 years, you'd build a relationship. So now the branch is no longer a bank. The branch is Jamie and, and Ivan on the cell phone and getting a call and say, listen, I, I, I got, I got, we got a property. It's a hot property. There's going to be a lineup, but I know I can get in there. And, and, and can you meet me there tomorrow, Ivan? Is there, for sure someone's going to meet you there. You know, that's why, that's why private lending is getting so big is because the banks are just they're too worried about shareholders and they're too worried about people who are worried about losing their jobs. So they, they've taken the, the art out of lending. Now it's just, you know, this is, the, this is the formula. This is what it has to be. This is the loan to value. This is the debt service ratio. This is what the guy's credit score has to be. If it's a little bit out, if uh, yeah. you, they get booted, you know? So a lot of people think that our, our clients are our, our borrowers our credit risks. That's the first question I get when I meet someone new, what business are you in? Oh, so why can't they go to the normal bank? Because they're smart. <laughs> because they know if they go to the normal bank, they'll still be waiting for the approval two and three months later for the mortgage and the vendor will find 50 other buyers. Uh -huh. You know, so if, 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 if I can just you know, like just say, like I, I picture myself in a service business. I don't picture myself in a in a in a uh, in a uh, ad adversary business. Like I'm on one side of the table, and the borrowers are on the other side. We're on the same side. We have to get to the finish line. So me and my investors make their interest, which is reasonable in my opinion, because it's very short term, and and the the person has a fantastic project. Yeah. And if the project runs into trouble, then it's not going to be like, uh, oh, no, I'm going to lose everything now. It's going to be, listen, how do we fix it? How do we get it to the end? How do we, every project has to have, has to come to a good conclusion as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. just, and that starts with, uh, with, um, with getting good people together. You know, so building a team, yeah. Building a team, long-term relationships. You know, it doesn't. Yeah. I'm not saying it's me. It can be anybody that you you feel comfortable with and talking to and borrowing from and and knowing that they're not going to come and put you against the wall. I mean, and I mean that. I don't mean that in a bad way or whatever. I mean like, who's going to push you to? If someone's putting financial pressure on you, then it can lead to bad financial decisions. So. When someone comes and wants to borrow from us, I want to see a, a I want to see a relaxed atmosphere, meaning that I want to see a relaxed deal. I have to see a deal which is good for the borrower and good for the lender that can't have a margin that's going to be five percent or ten percent. Has to be a deal that if a mistake gets made, or if a, or if a work site gets closed down for three months because of some crazy pandemic that the whole, the whole house of cards doesn't fall down. The, all the guys, we, Jamie and I, we have what, Jamie, 45 mortgages roughly now, 40, 45, something like that. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. So how many guys asked us for, for a delay of payment? Two. Yeah. There were two guys. And, and uh, one of them in, in, in May, you asked for a delay in May, and in June this month, he paid May and June together that's good that's fair yeah and and it's all, all that to say is it is, is that it's 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 us working together also yeah. right so you know I'm, ba I'm babbling at this point no no but i like i like what you said about you have the job now of uh of banks and because now banks have replaced the relationship part with an algorithm 
and mm. we, we understand why is this too bad and creates a market for guys like you and at the same time you're right that right now there's so much money chasing deals that ev everyone's having pressure in a way for sure well you see it you see it in the in the, in the prices and you see listing prices of five hundred thousand dollars and then you read the next day at five for so five seventy five mm. <laughs> right you know so that's it's it feeds on itself, which to me indicates that one day it's going to stop feeding on itself. And I don't know. I don't know if if uh, the governments can keep on printing Serb money and can keep on feeding feeding the the, the, the fire the way they are with, but just by injecting so much money into the economy. Um, and if this wave hits again and it sh has to shut down again, then I think there's going to be real opportunity for, for, uh, to buy real estate at decent prices. That one fellow that I told you about um, that made fabulous money and uh, owns a private island and, and asked him the question in 1976 when, the, when the, the, the Parti Québécois got elected here and the threat of separation came very high and everyone was worried. I asked him, I said, well, you know, what are you going to do if the place ever separates? And he was buying properties like crazy. He was buying apartments for twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars a door, wow. like fifty-unit buildings for twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars a door, and with the help of a private lender. So I said, I said, what are you going to do if it separates? He says, what are you do? He says, you know what? I'll be pissed off. <laughs> that was his answer. I'll be pissed so, off if people still have to live somewhere. Exactly. I'll be pissed off. But so it's the same kind of thing. If the wave hits again and prices do take a tumble, that's when, you, that's when it's going to be time for bold moves. And that's when, that's when it's going to be time for, for uh, um, um, you know, coming to guys like me and Jamie and saying, listen, I think now's the time to, to make a move on something. And here's the reasons why, why we come to it. I'd love to ask you one more question because we're already over time. But what, okay. uh, I mean, COVID, at the beginning, everyone, well, some, some were thinking that the market was going to crumble and that there'd be houses, houses for cheap and that, you know, with 15% unemployment, like it's yeah. going to go belly up. And I, I don't want to say nothing happened. It's just in Montreal, at least the market is still solid. Prices keep increasing. Well, I was going to say, what do you make of all that? Well, I think, I think, uh, I think people that had, property, I, well, there's different, different segments of the market, right? So my, hum, my humble opinion is, whether it's right or not, is that the people that, that, um, that can't make a living uh, from their house, that have to actually go out and make a living, are going to start feeling a lot of economic pressure. That's why the, the government is opening things now, because they just can't leave it closed much longer, because so many people are in the service business, the restaurants, for example, uh, um, salons, hair co uh, coiffures, whatever you call them. So these people have to really start making a living now, even with the risk, because then they really cannot, will not be able to afford to pay rent or put food on the table. And, and the government cannot keep on throwing $2,000 a month at, at, at all these people. So that's one segment. So I think, I think the lower end of the economy, like even middle class, like lower middle class, I think if, if, if their situation doesn't get remedied shortly, then I think there's going to be a lot of downward pressure on that real estate, that segment, whether it's homes or, or duplexes in areas that, are, that, are, that you know, are, are more depressed. The upper segment, the people are just, can just hang on, you know, I mean, uh, in, in, for the most part. But don't kid yourself, there's a lot of people in that segment that live paycheck to paycheck also and they don't have a lot of money in their bank and uh, they have a lot of they have a lot of peer pressure to keep up with certain lifestyles so all that to say is if if there is a second wave and and uh, and people's credits are too high and they don't have any any backup uh, resources then i think the real estate is going to start coming down i mean uh, it, it just i mean it, in terms of commercial industrial real estate, I don't think it'll happen because I think there's a huge move to online shopping and all these, all these uh, online uh, retailers need distribution centers, um, you know, and, and industrial properties fit that bill. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's, 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 you know, when I start thinking about economy, my mind goes in a million different directions all at the same time. So it's hard for me to, to stay yeah, on, yeah. On, on one thing. But the, the bottom line is, is, is this the, a vaccine is needed and this thing has to go away. If we're opening up too soon, then it's a big risk. I don't, I don't think Quebec is being smart personally. I mean, we have it, we see it, what's happened in the States and Florida and California and, uh, and all these play, places that opened up quickly. They're, they're having the highest number of, 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 uh, of, of positive, uh, positive um, tests. 4,000, I think, in Florida just uh, yesterday. I mean, it's, it's a huge number. They had the highest number of positive uh, uh, tests, positive tests worldwide in one day. I think it was 180,000 yesterday. So I don't want to be crazy negative, but, uh, uh, but on the other hand, out of every, out of every uh, unfortunate episode comes an opportunity. You know, so uh, if, if someone is, for whatever reason, finds themselves in a, in a situation where they have to sell their home, or they, they, they have to, you know, get out, uh, out from under certain, uh, um, certain financial pressures, I would suggest if there's a if there's anybody in there that fellas you feel comfortable uh, working together on certain things that that uh, you maybe for the first you know try it pool your resources. There's online resources that 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 um, and please don't ask me for the names right now because I don't remember them. Um, but there's there's places you can go where you'll see where uh, sixty day notices are are are, are issued. You know, and then you'll see them right away and make a phone call. You know, I can maybe buy your home for cash. Maybe I can, you know, and it's, a, it's another resource where you can go knocking on doors. Uh, you know, so I, it's a matter of being creative. Yeah. I think, but I, and I think the opportunities will be there and they'll be born out of someone else's uh, misfortune, unfortunately. But, um, JLR for the 60 day notice. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, um, that's really what I think. Mm -hmm. Hey, Johnny, you had a question? No. Okay. Okay. I know we could continue this for hours, but again, I want to Can I just uh, say something. Uh, right. Ivan, uh, thank you so much for uh, the talk. And one, one reason I really enjoyed it is because of all the stories you tell. I'm a person that like, loves stories and that's one of the reasons I got into real estate is because the stories behind how the real estate the story behind that toaster guy behind that I'm like of course you have to sell it <laughs> we're gonna be horrible if you don't sell it <laughs> so <laughs> it's really the stories and you you, you told a lot of parables and I really loved it thank you so much I appreciate that you know it's a I, when I was doing my appraisal work like for 10 years uh, my favorite one of my favorite expressions was like every building has a story, like every piece of land has a story, you know. And uh, if you've ever gone on the index of a movable, which you know, what the you know what the index is, Simon, it's basically Quebec. Every place in the world has a, a, a central land registry system. So if you go uh, index des immeubles, you'll see um, uh, it's basically a, a government-run. Uh, um, um, listing of all the properties, whether it's land, houses, yeah. buildings, no matter what, and their whole history yeah. from, the, from the time the lot was created to today. And every building has an amazing history, like, uh, you know, and then sometimes you find it when you're over, you're renovating out, you're renovating a home, right? You open up a wall and you just, the, the old guy put an old Coke bottle in there from 1925, yeah. you know, or an old newspaper. You know, a carpenter left something behind. So it's, it's the newspaper is common. Yeah, I love this. Yeah, it's great. I, I enjoy that part too. It's true. All right, folks. Thank you so much for for your attendance. So thank, thank you very you. much thank to Jamie and Ivan. I really appreciate it. You gave me a you gave me an older old fart something to talk about. <laughs> hey, thank you guys. always have something to learn from one another. So. I, I, I hope I did something. Thank, Jamie will be more interesting. I'm telling you, he's going to start with that dancing story. I can't wait. <laughs> hey, Jamie, <laughs> we, we got to talk afterwards. We got to we got to book you, and we got to come on at some point. Now you're, 
now you're really going to uh, expect it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Who knows? I'm kidding. No problem. All right. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you for joining. And uh, we will have, okay, so yeah, bars are reopening and stuff. I have to look at the calendar. I'd like to start doing maybe one event a month that's online and then one event a month that's in real life uh, outside and go for, go have a drink and lubricate conversation. So mm -hmm. I will keep you posted. Look at the, look at the meetup group. And uh, for sure, the next one is July 7th. Um, I have uh, several people that are that might be coming on. It's not sure exactly which one yet, but we'll have another great interview. So thank you very much to everyone and uh, hope to see you soon. If you have any feedback, again, send me a little message, write, call. My phone number is 514-836-5519. No shame. Uh, there you go. Thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you, Axel. Thank time. you. Everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. appreciate it. Bye.